Hey everybody, I'm Leif Halverson with the Fort Henry Party, and this is the video that I said I was going to be working on talking about using this historic squash um, as a, uh, an additional good alternative to food that we use while out in the field, things that could have been available to us. And if you're in my neck of the woods, um, Montana, North Dakota border up around Fort Union, this is something that you definitely would have had access to. Um, I had posted pictures, and I'm going to scroll some of them through here, of a project that I did this very same thing with my fourth grade students um, here in my classroom where I'm filming this. Um, as part of our Indian education for all things that we do, teaching them about native culture. And I chose the Mandan, Hidats, and Arikara specifically because they're in our area, and this is something that they could do at home. Uh, so the history. This information that I'm sharing with you comes from a combination of two books about the same woman, all right? Uh, the first one that you'll definitely want to have a copy of is called Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, all right? There was an anthropologist dude by the name of Wilson who interviews her later on in life. She's actually from the Knife River Indian Village area, all right? She grew up there, um, and so all these gardening practices we get from her. Her name was Wahidi Wea translated uh, you know, out is Buffalo Bird Woman. Um, and he wrote a second book about Wahidiwia called Wahini, because it's tough to spell words like Wahidiwia, um, where she describes to him what life was like as a girl growing up in a Hidatsa village. Okay, now they're Earth Lodge dwelling people, um, Mandan Indian villages. This is all part of that that Lewis and Clark comes across. Trading has been going on there for a long time, you know, and a bunch of our, our folks that are looking into things like the Northwest Company and Hudson Bay Company, along with American Fur Company, woohoo, um, all end up over there at some point in time, all right? So especially here, places like Fort Union, where, where I work at in the summertime, if you're in my neck of the woods, this is stuff that you've got access to. So, Wahini, Wahidiwea, we'll just call her Wahidiwea because that's actually how you say her name. She describes in the book, Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, how this process was done. Now, the Hidatsa families had their own gardens, large gardens, and they would grow things like squash, like uh, uh, corn and beans. They had some flowers. The Eurekara even had watermelon, which tastes doggone tasty, by the way. And within those gardens, they would build these platforms that the young girls in that family would go and sit on, and they would actually sing to the crops, all right? The corn especially, it was believed was essentially a living thing. I mean, it is, it's, it's a plant and it's growing, but they essentially believe like there's this soul-like aspect to it and them singing to it encourages it to flourish and grow better in a similar type of fashion as what it was for these young girls as they're listening to their songs of their mothers in the earth lodges and throughout their daily lives, the happiness, the joy that comes from that helps to provide a, a good upbringing, good growing. And so that was thought that with the corn and the aspect and connection that they had there, it was a very good thing for it. So from these platforms that they had built inside these gardens, these young girls are singing to the corn, they're singing to all of the plants that are growing in there. They're scaring off the crows and the birds. They even had scarecrows that they would build as well, but the girls are actually going in and scaring them, and she talks about how they would have to move the scarecrows from time to time because the birds would get wise to the fact that they weren't actually people. Uh, deer, another wild game that would come in, as well as stopping the young boys that are coming in and pilfering, or trying to pilfer, food from the garden. We get to this stage here now. So squash was harvested several different ways. It wasn't always done at the same time. Some went to full maturity, where you got the seeds, where, where it seeded out on the inside, and they would eat those, and they would save the seeds for the following year's crop from the, the better squash. Um, and they would harvest them as they were smaller. Sometimes these were called four or five day squash, if I'm remembering correctly. You'll, you'll find that in Buffalo Bird Woman's garden. Um, so these are squash that are not fully mature. They may or may not have started to have seeds form on the inside of them. And the skin is relatively thin on them. They would then be uh, sliced into slices about three-eighths of an inch thick. Now when that was being done, when those squash were picked, the, uh, the widows, uh, other women in, the, uh, in, in that village that maybe didn't have as big of a garden, maybe they were widowed, uh, maybe they didn't uh, 
weren't thriving as well. They would come and they would assist with this process. And as they are slicing up the squash, the first two, three, or four pieces on both ends of the squash, they would get to keep as payment for helping that family with the preparing of the squash for it to be dried, okay? Which is kind of a neat thing. Now, the way that the drying would happen next is they would have in the ground four corner posts, like you do when you're building a drying rack or a scaffold, that have Y ends. A uh, pole goes in between both of those, and then you would have these skewers that would lay across them that the squash would be skewered on. Most of the time this is made out of willow branches that they're getting from the river bottoms um, of a thickness that would support these squash hanging on them and drying and these slices in between those two poles that are between the corner posts. Um, so what would happen is at the one end, they'd go about an inch or so and they'd do an incision around that end and then leave that but strip off all the rest of the bark the rest of the way on that, that uh, um, piece from the willow, and then they would sharpen the end so that you have the skewer with kind of a button on the end. You would then take those squash slices and slide them onto that skewer, a finger width apart, Wahidi Wea describes in Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, and they would be set on that scaffold to dry for the next three or four days. Again, there are girls that are in the garden that are scaring off the birds and everything else while this process is taking place. And I think if it started to rain, they would either take them down and put them inside the earth lodge or they tried to cover them. I'm not remembering correctly, but go ahead and read that. It's a thin book. It's an easy read. And uh, you'll, you'll know the answer for sure that way. After three or four days goes by, they actually shrink down quite a bit. And then what they would do is they would take all those pieces on that skewer and just squish them together, twist them around because the flesh has begun to adhere on that skewer. After they've got them all twisted around and they're moving around loosely, they would then separate them back out, that finger width apart again, and let them sit for an additional three to four days. At that point, they would then take the skewers, pull them out so that you've got all of these medallions of dried squash with that hole in the center, and they would take cordage, and, with, and at one end of the cordage, they would have like a, a wooden stick needle type of a thing, and the other end was just the end of the cordage. They would tie that piece of the cordage, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, around that first piece of squash. So they'd go through it, tie it, and then they would send it through the center of all the rest of those and leave it like a garland. Now with that needle that's at the end, once the string or cordage went through, they would then twist that wooden needle sideways so that it wouldn't be able to be pulled through that last piece of squash. And that, those garlands would then be hung up inside the earth lodges to continue drying at that point, okay? From there, what they would do is they might go inside the cash pit that was inside the earth lodge or it would find its way inside of par flesh um, uh, folders to be taken with them because they've got two different villages. They've got their spring and summer village, which was usually up on the bluffs by the river, and their winter ones, which were smaller earth lodges and not as warm as what you might think, um, would be down on the river bottoms. So they were lucky if they could last two or three years, those winter ones, because when the spring rise would happen and the ice came through and they'd just wipe all those out and they'd have to rebuild them. Their summer ones would go about 10, 15 years a lot of times before they would have to rebuild those. So they're going from one location to another and this is a shelf stable type of food that they can take with them. So that's why it's going into those things. And like I said, other squash are letting grow um, further out and they're enjoying that throughout the year as well. Some they're specifically keeping for seed and everything. This is for long-term storage, okay? So what do you end up doing with that afterwards? Well, what, you'll, what you and I anyway are gonna end up doing is we're gonna take that dried squash that we've got. You don't have to put it on the garland to do that. Uh, you can just leave it as it is. Um, take it off when it's time and you are gonna make a soup out of that along with pemmican. Okay, but how do we get there? Okay, Leif, I don't have a drying rack. Um, it's winter outside though in Montana right now for whatever dopey reason. It's 39 degrees and we've got rain. We haven't had a real honest to God snowstorm yet. Still waiting on that monstrosity yet. So how do I do that? Well, you can do it inside. I've dried a lot of squash in my classroom here and I haven't had any issues whatsoever. Resist the temptation to toss slices of squash on a dehydrator. 
Dehydrators also use heat. You kind of halfway cook it, unless you've got just an air option. Do it this way, besides it looks cooler. Um, so what you're gonna need to do, get yourself a squash. Don't worry about it being a historic one. We're just doing this so that we can experience it right now to get you jump started on this. Get yourself a butternut squash, okay? Go to the grocery store. A lot of us will have access to a thing like a butternut squash um, at our grocery stores. Um, as far as your skewer, you can go down to the river bottoms. I think it would be awesome if you could do that. I've been able to do this at Fort Union where I've done this same thing. Went down to the river bottoms there, cut my willow sticks, made my skewers out of that. If you don't have access to that, you're in the middle of a, of a huge town or city someplace, go on down to the hardware store and buy yourself a minimum of a 3 8 inch diameter dowel. One end you're going to sharpen to a point. So you've got your knife, you've got your cutting board, you've got your butternut squash, you're going to start slicing that. Now, I had camera problems, so I've actually sliced up all three of the squash that I've had because it took three attempts. This is number four, so it's all sliced up, unfortunately. So we would take our, we would take our butternut squash. We've got all our squash together, and we're going to slice it into these 3 8 inch diameter pieces. Now, if you're not using butternut squash, if you're using a historic squash, like Hidatsa squash or Mandan squash, if you've got one that's fully matured and gets to the seeds, make sure that you've got some paper towels Save all those seeds, toss them on the paper towel, spread them out, set them off someplace to the side so they can dry so that you've got those to plant in your garden next year, okay? Then, once you've got your medallions all sliced and everything, you're gonna take your skewer. Now, don't forget, the first several front end pieces and the back end several some odd pieces. Remember, all these go to grandma or whoever it is the lady in their life is that's helping you with this project, okay? So let's keep that a consistency, all right? We've got it all ready to go, and then we're just going to start skewering them on. Have your more solid ones go on first. And don't forget, we're doing these about a finger width apart. And then in any of the ones that, like once you get into the, the cavity, then put some of those on. All right, have those kind of in towards the middle that helps out with things. And sometimes as you're going, you know, slicing through these things, especially as you get towards the end where you've got that bowl shape where the uh, the seeds are at, sometimes you end up with crescent moon pieces, all right? You can actually cut a notch in those and put those on there too. I usually put those on at the end, leave space for them, but uh, put them on at the end. And we'll just keep on skewering our squash on here. Again, I've got three squash worth here. <laughs> We'll do a couple more and we'll call her good because you've got the idea at this point. And we've got our butternut squash all skewered. So inside, or you can do this in a garage or a shop as long as I'd say it's at least 60 some odd degrees. Um, inside your house, it'll dry just fine, provided if you've got a significant other with you there that they'll let you hang this out someplace. In my classroom, I've hung this between two music stands. I've hung it between two bookshelves. Um, I've also done it where I've tied string on the two ends and I've hung it from the ceiling or between things as well. So we're gonna set this to dry now, um, let it rest three days or so, and then we're going to go and smoosh all these together, twist them around so that they're not stuck anymore, and then we're gonna go and separate these out again. They will be significantly smaller than this size that we are seeing right here and we're gonna let them dry an additional three or four more days. And as long as they're not still damp, then you can take them off. If you want to do it in the Hidatsa fashion after that week has transpired, take these off, go ahead and uh, you know, run cordage between there and hang them up like a garland on the wall or something um, to let them continue to dry out. Or you can just leave them on the, uh, the skewer until you're ready to use them. So these are ones that are completely dry. This is butternut squash as well. And these ones we don't even have to worry about making into a garland, although that would sure look cool hanging up in camp if you did. And we've now got our dried squash that we are using in the style that we've learned from the, the Hidatsa and Mandan and Arikara tribes. So the question that I got 
from Ryan, who's one of our one of our brothers in the AMM. He goes, what next? What do we do with it once we've got it dried? Well, we're going to store it somehow. This can go into a cloth bag. Um, I've got a uh, par flesh folder that I put together specifically for uh, keeping my dried squash in. You can leave it in these medallions like this. I've cooked them up like that in the trade kettle. Um, I've also got a birch bark container that it goes into as well. And what you can do is you can break these down, break them down into pieces like that. I've actually got butternut squash in here and I've got some uh, Hidatsa squash mixed in there from squash that I dried last year. And what you're gonna do after that, while you're in camp, is you're gonna make a soup or stew out of this. Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your, take your pemmican that you've got, and you're gonna to toss that in your tin cup or in your trade kettle, and that's going to be our, our base, you know, our meat base, and then you are gonna to toss in your squash. Now, I can't tell you how much to toss in. You're just gonna to have to experiment with that, but I can tell you this. As it reconstitutes itself, all right? So we'll look at one of these that we've got here. Here's one that's all dried down, right? As this reconstitutes, it's gonna go back to roughly the original size it was when you sliced it up. Um, and the skin on the outside, you're not even gonna notice that after it's, it's reconstituted because of how thin it is, okay? So you are gonna see that much of growth that that swells up in while you're cooking, okay? So the, the flavors that you get from the pemmican along with the sweetness of the squash, and you're gonna let this simmer for an hour to two hours, that's gonna reconstitute back up. It's gonna thicken up a little bit. It's gonna be a very good flavored soup or stew that you've got together. You can throw other things in there as well, but even if it's just simply the pemmican and the squash, you are gonna enjoy that nice warm meal, especially on a winter camp. So this is a very attainable project that you can do, guys, very easily. All you need, get yourself any squash from the store that you want, I'd suggest starting with a butternut squash because it's easier to start with. Cut that sucker three-eighths of an inch in diameter. Don't forget, if the woman in your life is helping you out or your daughters, these end pieces go to them, keeping things historic. Go ahead and skewer them on finger width apart. Let them dry for three days. Smoosh them together, twist them around, separate them out again. Let them dry for additional three or four more days. Leave them on the skewer till you're ready to use them or go ahead and make the garland out of it. Put them inside your cloth bag or your birch bark container or your par flesh and wait for uh, the next camp that you get to enjoy those on. Now, if you wanna go more the historic route, um, like for example, now this is from the pictures you saw earlier. This is from the uh, Hidatsa squash. This is from an older variety of the Mandan summer squash. And this is from a, not nearly as old, but, but they're still historic, obviously, of the Mandan squash as well. Um, I would suggest starting by contacting Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site outside of Stanton, North Dakota. They usually keep seeds in their um, uh, bookstore. And also the rangers there also keep a historic garden, or try to anyway, keep a historic garden going in the summertime. Um, so I checked there first, they might be able to provide you with some additional resources. Place number two that I would check out, also in North Dakota, uh, try contacting the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center outside of Washburn, North Dakota, which is near where the reconstructed Fort Mandan is that Lewis and Clark had. Uh, they've got a whole variety of seeds that they have in stock usually. Number three, another good place um, that you might have a little bit better luck for these type of seeds versus uh, the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center, Museum of the Fur Trade. They've got a number of these, well, they've got like seven or eight different varieties of, of seeds, which includes the Mandan squash, uh, and oftentimes the Arucara, um, uh sunflowers, pot, sometimes the sunflowers, but they're uh, watermelon. But they're a good source for the things like the beans and the corn and, and these squash. Um, and if you're looking at other things like, say, prairie turnips, for example, um, came across this place called Curry Moon Nursery. You can actually get those prairie turnips uh, seeds from these guys. Now it's going to take you three or four years before they're actually big enough and you've got them established in your yard or wherever it is that you're growing before you can use them. But you can even get seeds 
from guys like this. So that's four different spots that you can check with to get these historic seeds. I hope you take on this project. Again, get yourself a butternut squash, get yourself a dowel from the hardware store, slice it up and dry it, toss it in your cloth bag, your par flesh, or your birch bark container, and use it on the next uh, camp that you're on.